Now, tech giant Facebook has blocked news pages last year to anticipate Australian legislations that would see it pay for content. However, in doing this, it also took down essential pages for hospitals as well as emergency services and even charities too. The social media platform says it wasn't intended, but whistleblowers say they were aware of what they were doing. Let's bring in Karen Sutherland from the University of Sunshine Coast and Professor Karen Freeberg from the University of Louisville. Welcome to you both. Now, Karen Sutherland, did Facebook know what they were doing? What did the whistleblowers have to say? Well, the whistleblowers said they, that they knew, they discussed actually the impact that it would have if they used a particular algorithm to suppress and limit Australian news sites, that it would be more of a blanket ban on all these other sites that, are, you know, that we actually really use, like charities and, and um, government services, but they still went, went, went ahead with it anyway. So, uh, and then later apologised for doing it. But yeah, the whistleblowers are saying they knew full well what the impact was going to be before they did it. Professor Freeberg, has the beast of big tech been truly revealed here? I mean, what else are they doing that we might not know about? Absolutely. I, that's one of the biggest concerns that we have even here in the US, um, but also it's a global issue, um, along with transparency, um, looking at what we are actually seeing um, come across our feeds. Is it what we want to see? Is it something that needs to be changed? But I think also the biggest concern that we have is censorship and data privacy. And protection and so all of these issues are coming to light and i think big tech including companies and platforms like facebook have um, a responsibility to be transparent and upfront with what they're doing and so i think the global conversation is happening um, at an escalated rate on all of these issues Karen, I mean, this here is a very serious issue because when this happened, it blocked emergency service pages, healthcare pages, people's access to help. This is extremely detrimental to people's health and well-being and safety. Will they be held accountable for this? I doubt it. I really doubt it. And I think, and it happened at a time when Australia was about to begin the rollout of the vaccine for um, the COVID vaccine. So they, they knew the timing as well and just the impact it would have because they wanted the Australian government to do what they wanted. And in the end, the government did sort of uh, change their hard stance on it and came up with an agreement, but it is actually really watered down. So essentially Facebook got their way by behaving in this way. But Professor Freeberg, I mean, if this is what happened, doesn't this just go to show that how can we ever hold big tech accountable if they are able to make changes like this that drastically impact people's health and safety and well-being, potentially their lives as well? If we are unable to hold them accountable for these kind of mistakes, then what does that say about the power and the future of big tech? Yeah, absolutely. And this has been something that we've um, been discussing here in the U.S., not only among researchers and consultants, but across the board. And we are kind of seeing that a lot of people are kind of pushing back. Uh, you have seen the user base from Facebook, for example, decrease for the first time in quite a long time. And I think that people are taking their actions as their voice of concern. And so you, you are kind of seeing a growing movement um, to Think about new ways uh, to kind of let big tech know like, hey, this is not okay. And, but I, I think what we are seeing right now is that the global conversation is happening. People are getting more aware and educating themselves on these growing issues. And I think um, there are discussions in terms of holding big tech accountable, at least I know, of course, in the um, European Union, but here in the States as well. So we have a long ways to go um, to do that. But I think the conversation is moving in that direction. We do as well, and I think the biggest concern here too as well is what does it say to future whistleblowers because why would they come out and speak? Why would they put their names on the line and come out and risk speaking out if nothing even gets done and they're not going to be held accountable anyway? So what's the point in speaking out? Um, yeah, there's a really complex issue there. Uh, also heading our news, Elon Musk plans to increase Twitter adoption rates by 200% in just three years. Karen, is this really possible? I say good luck. And I, I look, I mean, and I'm speaking from an Australian's point of view, Twitter isn't, you know, it's used here, but it's not one of our most popular platforms. So I'm not sure how much of that user base would actually come from Australia, but from um, looking at some of the tactics that they're proposing um, in this strategy, they're saying things like advertising and subscription, but I mean, will people pay for Twitter? Uh, will, will the current features be rolled back so much that 
uh, people who are heavy users will have to pay in order to have experience what they have now and maybe a little bit more. So I think they're the questions that we'll ask. Um, you know, I mean, it would have to be pretty enticing to, to bring more people over to Twitter when there's other free platforms like TikTok where, where their user numbers are, you know, growing so much, you know, by the day. Um, it'll be very interesting to see what sort of tactics are used to try and actually meet this this target. I, I'll wait and see. I, I'm very interested to see what he's going to do. <laughs> uh, Professor, what do, what do you think about this news? And I guess I also want to get your thoughts on Donald Trump potentially making his way back onto the platform as well. That's news today. Yeah, absolutely. And so I agree with Karen. Um, I actually had a chance to spend time, my sabbatical a few years ago in Australia, and that was one of the things that she feared is Twitter was not a dominant platform down in Australia. But here in the U.S., um, we are seeing some traction. And surprisingly, I actually had this question with my students and who are Gen Z, and I asked them, would this, like, would some of these features be enticing to them? And the one that came up as being very enticing, they'd be like, oh, yeah, we would fully be on this platform, would be the verification aspect, like being able to have that check mark saying, yes, we are verified, because that is kind of a status symbol for them, that they're able to say, yes, this is me, this is you know what I'm able to do. And we have seen kind of a resurgence on Twitter, especially with Gen Z. Uh, they basically are using TikTok and Twitter. They use them for different purposes. So for the younger generation, there is that interest of kind of a, having additional features. But I think, you know, with, while, with Dr. Sutherland, um, time will tell. I, I'm, I'm curious to kind of see, like, will it be 20 percent? Oh, no, 200 percent, excuse me. Um, increase. It might be a little bit, it might be not. And so it really, I wish we had a crystal ball to kind of see where we're going. But um, Elon Musk does have a history of building things um, rapidly. Yes. So it'll be fun to see how it goes. Professor Karen Freeberg and Dr. Karen Sutherland, thanks for your analysis today. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much.